Happy Wednesday, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute, where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over the greatest adventure movie Walt Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnston-directed feature, The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane nerd from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And Jim, we found a pretty interesting guest this time, to say the very least. Oh, for sure. This is somebody who's... Uh, Boy, just up to his neck or past his neck in the aviation world. Uh, somebody that I've uh, known primarily online for several years, but uh, um, got a chance to meet face to face just recently. And then he and I also have a have a weird connection deep in our distant past that maybe we'll uh, we'll mention. It's uh, it's a real joy to welcome uh, Mart Klepper. Now, Mart is uh, is known uh, for the uh, sort of the currently. Uh, uh, available but not necessarily on uh, hiatus. active yeah the on hiatus <laughs> but still wonderful blog airpigs.com that's airpigs with a z and uh he's got a great uh, a restoration project going all kinds of things but most importantly he's a big fan of the rocketeer so mart welcome to the show glad to have you hey thank you very much i'm really happy to be here it's awesome it's uh, it's fun we have you on just at the right time because we've been looking at this uh, this GB that's over <laughs> Howard Hughes' shoulder uh, in this particular minute, and uh, we got to talking about uh, how it's all put together, and that this is even though it's a prop, it's somebody had to build that thing, and we know that you're you you are really from the uh, from the ground up uh, rebuilder of uh, of beautiful vintage aircraft. Well, and... I I definitely have a project that I'm doing, and it's kind of interesting because I, I don't have a ton of experience doing. Um, this, um, but I definitely do in the last year. Um, and I actually started building an airplane when I was in high school. So I guess I can say that I do have some experience. Um, I started building a, a home build. And then back in the 90s, I, I recovered an airplane, uh, an older style airplane with fabric and such. And then now I'm doing this Super Cub. So uh, I don't have a huge amount of experience, but um, I have done several projects for sure. Uh, now, th- uh, this one that you're doing is technically a, a, a restoration but it's it, it seems like you're it's like george washington's axe you've replaced the yeah. handle and the <laughs> and the haft on it so yeah. it's uh it, it is a lot like it. It's a 1959, so it's it's an old airplane, but certainly not Rocketeer old. But um, it, it's a Super Cub. So actually, I was thinking about this uh, earlier today that the the J3 Cub, the Cub that most people, even if they're not deep into aviation, know, the yellow Cub that's pretty common, is from the the Genesis is in the 30s and certainly into the 40s. And then the Super Cub is an outgrowth of that from I think it was the, the late 40s and certainly the early 50s. So it does look a little bit different, but interestingly so much of this particular airplane that I'm doing is very much like the GB as far as its structure and the way it's put together. Now, it's not a race plane. It's not fast. It's not, you know, incredibly beautiful in the same way that the GB is. But the way it's put together is, is really remarkably similar. Uh, does it have uh, the, the turnbuckles? Is the, are the wings supported somehow externally? Or is it... They're externally supported but by the rigid strut, which became more popular than um, shortly after the era of the GB. Um, although you still see the biplanes, even the modern biplanes today, many of them still have the flying wires like the GB has on them which are they're real thin and they're airfoil shaped and, and they don't create a huge amount of drag. Um, but the disadvantage, I think, that you could say to them is that they only provide strength in one direction, you know, when you pull against them. Because if you push against them, they just collapse. So you have to have another set on the other side of the wing. Uh, whereas with a rigid strut, it does uh, both directions in just one piece of uh, material. Um, so I think that's one reason why the, the rigid strut became more popular. Right. I, on a project like this, it, I would be lost at where do you start? Do, I mean, do you start with the aero structure? Do you start with the uh, the internals? I, 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 I've been watching you do, it seems like you're doing yeah. all parts at once. I'm not yeah, sure. it, it has been a little, like, you know, I think that probably depends on the individual and the way your, your brain is wired and, and how, you know, compartmentalized you need to be. Uh, I'm really good all over the place, um, which is part of my problem in this world that I'm sort of <laughs> all over the place. But um, so I, uh, I I don't I don't struggle with the idea of having several things you know going at once. And in, and in fact, I kind of like where I can be you know highly focused on one aspect and then just just drop it uh, when maybe either I come to a a hill too steep to climb in it for that moment, uh, or or I'm just tired, or there's a need to move to another spot, you know. And so, but I have taken the airplane all the way down to its bare bone structure, 
and uh, sandblasted the fuselage, which is made out of steel tubing, which would be very much like the GB fuselage, um, all welded together. Um, and in fact, back in the day, they used to use gas welding. So it's kind of cool. You got an actual, you know, super hot flame and you're melting the metal. And, uh, and I'm old school. I never really learned to arc weld like they do today with aircraft structures. Um, because uh, this is an interesting aspect, I think, that there are many home-built airplanes today that are still built... Uh, almost exactly the way that the GBR uh, or that the GB was, meaning that it's a steel tubing that's welded together, it's covered with fabric, uh, the wing might be wood or um, uh, aluminum spar uh, with ribs and fabric over that. And so, you know, this many years downrange, we're still thoroughly embracing the ideas and technologies that were in the GB structure. Now we have options that are vastly different as well, but these old techniques haven't gone away. So I think that's really, it's, it's awesome. One, because there's a heritage element to it. And two, it shows that the, these ideas are still truly viable ideas. They may not be the best solution, but oftentimes they're a, a less expensive solution. Uh, right. That's part of their part of their attraction. And there's something about putting on the leather gloves and getting out the oxyacetylene <laughs> welding and, and you know, the goggles and all the mask and just banging away on the, on the frame that you're, must feel really... You're, su you're supposed to wear gloves? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, kids, be careful out there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. No, just and, kidding. Um, but yeah, it is. It's, there's something really cool about the flame. I mean, I just got to say that uh, it, was, uh, it was back in the wintertime when I was doing uh, some welding on the airplane because I... I added several modifications uh, to the airplane, which you don't just do willy-nilly. There's a when it's a certified airplane like this, meaning that it was built in a factory and, and is under a, a bunch of strict rules, then you can't just be making modifications to it. They have to be certified modifications or supplemental type certificate modifications. And so, but we put several of those on there to add some utility to the airplane. And um, so welding was certainly um, one of the things that I had to do. And uh, just in the winter time when it's cooler and such, it's just pretty cool to have uh, uh, a little hot fire in your hand. So, yeah. <laughs> And when it comes to uh, to fabric, um, I'm trying to recall, Mark, do you know about when it was that we really switched from cotton, uh, which, you know, you would have seen in the you know, cotton and dope, mm -hmm. to uh, to the more synthetic things, Seconite and now polyfiber it, and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. It's something I've thought about more in this last year because of this project, um, and I've, I've, I have talked to some people, and I had some info, but it's kind of escaped me at the moment. Sure. It's somewhere, I think, in the early 60s. Um, yeah, this that's airplane, right where I was going to guess. Yeah, this airplane was built in 59, and it's it ha it was built with cotton. Um, and interestingly, um, it spent almost all of its life in South Dakota and only had 2,000 hours of flight time total on it since 59. So it was a fairly wow. low-time airplane. Wow. And, and the, I've learned since, never really thought about this before, but the weather conditions, the climate in South Dakota is, is very um, protective of airframes. Uh, you know, it's not a high moisture environment. There's not a lot of negatives to it. And so the airplane was just remarkably uh, well-preserved. Uh, and um, so it still had the original cotton fabric on it, oh, which wow. is uh, which is pretty amazing, which I'll interject this real quick. I don't know if you saw this Hal up at Oshkosh, but did you see the 1953 uh, Tri-Pacer that still has original fabric on yes, it? Yes, I did. That display. was a, that was amazing. That was just a total it, time capsule. Yeah, absolutely. What a what, it just walking around that thing and just uh, it, it was interesting because it was able to transport you back in time in a way that I've not experienced before with a, a normal uh, everyday, uh, you know, uh, personal airplane. Sometimes you feel that when you're looking at, at warbirds, you know, you truly get transported back in time. But here you could just imagine the hands of the Piper employees, you know, were the hands that made it look exactly the way it looked that moment. And uh, so that was just pretty cool. So, um, if you have the proper uh, conditions, you know, the cotton uh, can hold up uh, really, really well. But there's a variety of advantages for sure to the synthetic, the Dacron material that's been used since the, at least sometime in the 60s and certainly uh, through the 70s and on. And it's a little easier to work with and uh, because you basically, and this is what kind of uh, freaks people out that don't know about how this works, but basically it's, it's a, you know, it's a heavy clothing type uh, material. 
as far as its weight and you glue it on uh, different processes use different types of glue but you glue it on and then once the glue is has set you actually take a household iron and you iron the fabric and and significant sag and wrinkle come out of it and then it becomes uh, drum tight in the process too and uh, you have to be very methodical about it of course and such but it's a fairly simple uh, method by which you can uh, make the fabric nice and tight. As it turns out though, fabric work is still a lot of work um, when it comes to finishing it. There's there's just a lot of processes involved uh, uh, including uh, stitching the fabric down to the wing itself, uh, which I particularly enjoy, uh, which makes me extremely odd. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I've done just a little bit of, of rib <laughs> stitching and I just enough to to say to myself, I don't think I could ever be fast at this. Yeah, you know, I can do well, it, but boy, it yeah. just uh, it, I'm amazed at people who can just zip right through that. And we've got a couple of people who work in our shops at EA sure. who are amazing, of course. But yeah, well, and there's different procedures, and so once you get a procedure that works for your mind. Uh, you know that you can that kind of becomes a nice crutch. It makes it a lot easier, right. and uh, and you can't and and it depends on the individual. I will say though another thing that's kind of interesting is uh, that I have a, a very long history of attending uh, the event in Oshkosh. I've been an EAA member since I was a a kid, and um, the uh, that I learned to rib stitch when I was a teenager up at Oshkosh in one of the uh, forum tents. And that was a, just a real thrill for me because it was kind of cool because in the morning I learned to stitch and by, by lunchtime I was actually the instructor because <laughs> the, the instructor people would get tired of, you know, doing it over and over. So if they got somebody that came in that did a pretty good job, they'd turn them loose with showing other people. So here it was, you know, as a teenager, I'm showing other people how to rib stitch on these dummy wings that they have, uh, you know, in the tent. So, so anyway, stitching is just a, it's a really cool, I don't know, I kind of look at it as a very organic element to old airplanes that's just i think it's awesome oh absolutely you know very quickly speaking of uh you know when you were a kid i mentioned you and i had kind of an odd connection and that mm, is yes. that you and i uh crossed paths several years ago when i started at eaa and and we were you know linking to and, and i think kind of serializing a little bit of content from the air pigs uh-huh. air pigs blog and and uh communicated a little bit back and forth but i know it was you know your blog was something sort of on my plate to work with almost every day for quite a while and then of course facebook came around we became friends there and then we come to find out a few years into this uh sort of online uh, you know acquaintanceship and and uh, you know friendship based on all these wonderful mutual interests that uh, you and my brother were very very close friends when you were in something like second grade or something like that second grade yeah i think first and second grade yeah at um school out in california in the bay area (laughs) yeah amazing and 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 interestingly further connection that we both had dads who flew for united airlines and uh so that was kind of a a, another uh, really interesting uh connection uh to all that but it was interesting too because apparently you were younger enough that i i and and we were young as well that i I didn't really know never have any recollection of having met you and then i wound up down (laughs) in the la area shortly after that and then back into the midwest by the time i was 10 years old and uh so but those were interesting Mm -hmm. times for sure uh especially in uh, Foster City is where I was living, where you could see the airplanes on approach to San Francisco. Oh, sure. And uh, so that was a a real treat for me, especially when the 747 first came out. And uh, it was like watching a spaceship go by Uh, early. I remember (laughs) around our house, it was uh, up in Burlingame Hills. It was a huge deal. And my brother, Chris, you know, was uh, he was the one who would run through the house and announce on on those (laughs) rare special days that the winds were right. And the airplanes would be landing on runway one because we all had to go right outside the house because they'd be coming right over our house. You know, most of the time in San Francisco, you're landing on two, eight left or right. And. And, uh, but, uh, one boy, and they're landing on one. We were, uh, everybody <laughs> drop what you're doing. We're going to sit outside in the little hill go. and watch airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That, um, that airport provided a lot of entertainment yes, for, uh, for at least a handful of kids. Right. I know for sure back in those days. So, uh, yeah, so. I, I keep, I keep saying that even though we have the, the James Horner theme for the Rocketeer that, uh, that, uh, Tom so pro- uh, kindly provided for us, the real theme of this should be at the small world because every, yes. <laughs> everybody yeah. crosses paths with Hal eventually. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> yeah. It's, it just yeah. confirms that I'm the center of the universe. I think yeah. that's well, uh, yeah. simply put. We've, 
We've always wondered. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I'm willing to step up and confirm that now. You know, hey, speaking of uh, airplanes and the minute and everything else, uh, sure. uh, Jim and I, were, we were talking in yesterday's episode, we were talking about the end number on this airplane, NA-73. And, and uh, I was trying to recall if NA was ever a, a, a separate designation, and it was I was drawing a blank on it. But as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I can tell, rather, it actually wasn't. We had NR, NC, NL, and NX. Yeah. So I think NA was just totally, uh, totally fictitious. Yeah, and I was, I was noticing that uh, watching the minute specifically because, because uh, it's really interesting how this whole minute thing ch- changes your perspective. You're picking up on details that otherwise you just sort of, you know, gently absorbed but didn't really acknowledge. Mm-hmm. And so that stood out to me right away, and I thought, what are they saying there? That doesn't even make sense to me. Right. You know, uh, I, I wonder what their, what's the story behind that? Because maybe that was just some sort of somebody's initials or something. Yeah, like it could thought, be a nod hey, to almost anything. Yeah. You know, sure. we did talk about yesterday's episode that, uh, you know, that was the North Americans' internal designation for the P-51. It was oh, the NA-73, but I don't... I, you yeah. know, that doesn't make any sense. There's no obvious tie. It's right. much more likely, you know, that sure. uh, there was, uh, you issue. know, there was a, a production yeah. assistant named Abigail or something, and said, "Well, you right. know, we'll put your 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 name in here." In a letter I was thinking, I was thinking, like it it might be uh, from uh, from Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. I was trying it upside down, and it kind of looks like Elon. Oh, so I just, maybe it's Ellen. I don't or know. it could be, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just say, or if, you know, if you if you let the A stay an A, then you've got Elan, which is a nice yeah. French term for sort of grace and beauty like the lotus land yeah. but uh well th- this brings up a question that i have for you guys that relates to that particular airplane in, in that scene because um i don't know if it was something i heard just just real recently but um from the minute but i always assumed that that was an entirely different gb as far as the movie goes you know like yes. howard went ahead and built one from scratch for him and um, but so do we have any reason to think that that's the the old one repaired by Howard or do we think it's uh, and I don't think we have any definitive right. answer to this. But, you know, that that's what, a great question. I mean, we know from the, the standpoint of making the film that that this is a this is a, a mock up replica this is a mm-hmm. non flyable mock up uh-huh. um, that I've, I've come to be convinced as we talked about yesterday. Um, did at one point wear the yellow and black paint scheme for a couple of shots at uh, Santa Maria as Chaplin oh, Field. Um, and then, of course, there's, you know, Bill Turner's flyable GBZ replica sure. uh, that's now in the Museum of Flight in Seattle. But, you know, in the context of the story, I, I think when I first saw the movie, I kind of thought, oh, that was nice. Howard went and had his GB rebuilt for him. Uh-huh. But uh, um, it, it is a different end number. Right. So, you know, that tells me probably a different airplane. So, you know, Howard had it built, had it done, went to the Granville mm-hmm. Brothers and, you know, sure. commissioned it since, what, last night, I guess, basically. Well, how, how, how much time how, has this been? How about if I That's read from the, uh, the Rocketeer novel oh, there you go. from page, sure. page yeah. 243, right. paragraph 6. Mart, uh, uh, put your feet up. It's time for <laughs> it's story time with Jim. They're already right. there. It's, it says, and the roar... And the roar of a GB radial and oh at, yeah, and the roar of a radial GB engine grew louder, not softer. Then, to Cliff's sheer amazement, a brand new GB racer, black and white finish gleaming, taxied around the corner and eased to a stop before the diner. Leaves and branches were blown around, and Cliff and Jenny and Peavy, who had just emerged, shielded their eyes in the prop wash. Then the engine shut down, the canopy lifted, and Howard Hughes emerged, a canvas windbreaker over his brown suit. Now the rest of the Bulldog Cafe regulars emerged from the restaurant. His hand in Jenny's, Cliff approached the plane in wonderment as Hughes climbed from the cockpit. She's a beauty, Mr. Hughes. Thanks, said Hughes, putting the, patting the plane fondly. Built her myself. Next month she'll be ready for the Nationals. He smiled graciously at Jenny. Miss Blake, would you excuse us for a moment? Of course, she said in equal graciousness. Hughes pulled Cliff a few steps to the side and leaned forward confidentially i've been meaning to ask you what was it like <laughs> strapping that thing to your back and flying like a hawk so, oh as opposed to bad out of hell as it actually says yeah, exactly so the novelization was even more family friendly so mm. appa- apparently um built it myself and, and then it, it just mentions uh then he stared incredulously as one of hughes's uh, assistants pulled a piece of masking tape away from the rim of the cockpit revealed in hand lettered script were the words pilot cliff secord Yep. So, uh, and as we know from yesterday, that was the mysterious man in black who's the uh, the official Hughes sticker puller offer. Yeah, wearing some cheaters, which was kind of unusual for the 30s. 
He had those yeah. uh, those sunglasses. Oh on there, yeah, which was not a common element of the 1930s. Right. Um, and you know, speaking uh, quickly, just housekeeping wise, we talked in yesterday's episode. We were trying to figure out that sign off in the distance that was down the hill a ways. I thought yes. maybe it was garage, but it's actually quite in focus in a couple of shots here. It's gasoline, so it's a gas station ah. that we see down there. Oh, so, hey, can I interject? Of Speaking course. Speaking of signs, because um, as I was uh, looking this minute over real close, I fell in love with that uh, Bulldog Cafe sign. Oh, yeah. Isn't that just eats? gorgeous? And I was like, oh, my goodness. I, I want that so bad. But uh, I don't have – it's kind of funny because I don't have uh, – I have the old original um, – uh, souvenir book i guess or whatever because you guys are way beyond me with uh you know your your fandom basically oh. of things. we, uh, we and, just oh, know all the right people and, <laughs> yeah <laughs> hello mike but bruno I, but yeah. yeah that guy's amazing but uh i did get the book because i was i was very fascinated with the movie but i also had a robin hood prince of thieves book that i bought at that time ah. because i i really liked that movie too in fact that's the other thing i was going to say is that i saw all three of the things i saw the rocketeer i saw robin hood and i saw the terminator movie yeah. so so, so i don't know summer. why people yeah. didn't see all three of them that's a know, good point yeah you know i hadn't thought about because, it but i saw all three of those too in the theaters that summer you know yeah. I was going to movies all the time yeah. But uh, I guess I should have just kept going to see the Rocketeer over and over and over to yeah. send the right message. Yeah. So yeah. I guess uh, I we're part twice. of the problem, Mark. But Yeah, I saw it twice. I think I saw Robin Hood twice, actually, because um, I actually kind of liked it, except for the fact that Kevin Costner didn't have an accent. But, right. Um, anyway, um, yeah, yeah, but we, um, we do get a good view in this uh, in, in this particular minute of uh, the street names and. Uh, the Bulldog Cafe is obviously at the corner of Oxnard Street and Encino Road. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Encino Avenue, it looks like. Encino Avenue, yeah. excuse me, yes. That's that's interesting. We'll have to yeah. dig out the maps and uh, see if we spot where that uh, where that is. So I guess back to this GB for just a minute. So the novelization yeah. says, it has that line, Hugh says, I built it myself. Yeah. So something that he, I mean, we all agree that this is just the next morning, right? After, yeah, this is because sun, it's this in the news, it's in the newspaper that uh, the number three box office star in America died when flaming debris from a zeppelin crushed him in his car, and uh, and all that. So this next morning, so obviously this didn't just happen overnight, but something that Hughes was maybe just finishing, and he told his people paint Cliff's name on it, put a sticker over it, and I'm gonna you know. I'm and drop he didn't it off he him. didn't have it in his he didn't have it in his um, where the H1 was and the uh, auto gyro. No, it wasn't in there. Although it is interesting, you know, the paint scheme complements those all of his uh, the h1 was all natural metal but the auto gyro is black and white and so mm -hmm. they do go together a little bit and then of course toward the toward the uh, later part of this minute uh he gives uh, gives cliff a, a pack of beamons we see the beamons one last time in this movie and then he gets into that that gorgeous car it's a 1935 pierce arrow it's a model 845 that same uh, same car also showed up in uh, the wonder woman tv series back in the 70s ah, so so there's a little bit of trivia it, it is cool how they've taken that that opening scene and they've and they've brought back several of the elements from that the very opening scene of the movie really with the the gb and uh the gum and oh, things yeah. like that to, to sort of be the bookends for the whole experience and that yeah. just that flawless uh james horner score just coming behind everything tying it all back together that's yeah. that as uh, as uh, our composer Tom Geyer put it, you know, he Horner taught us that song with the opening frames mm -hmm. of the film, and then mm -hmm. and then now we know it, and and uh, you know we we get what it means every time we hear it all throughout the film. And it's kind of interesting that you say that because I I uh, was watching the movie um, uh, in various parts, and and I went all the way back to the start for something. In fact, actually, I wanted to see what the end number was for sure on the yellow. Team. Oh right. So I went all the way back to the start, and it, and I heard six seconds only of that music, and I just melted. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely melted. It's just so fantastic. So, and you know, part of it for guys that are for people that are really interested in aviation. Once you experience it, you connect aviation and that music together to a certain extent. So now, when you hear the music, you're having an aviation experience at the same time because of the movie. Absolutely. So it's just all the bigger. Um, at least for me, it is. I can't tell you how many times over the years, and I brought this up before that I've I've flown, you know, with music piped into the intercom or something with mm. with uh, parts of the Rocketeer score. 
and and of course Miller Hardens begin the beginning that just all had all ties together for me. Yeah. But that opening music with those that first shot, those hangar doors opening, that's mm-hmm. on a sunny day. That's just everything about that is the promise. It's this warm promise of of going flying. You know, you get the airplane out, it's beautiful, and that for a second you can almost believe that that anticipation is almost better than the flying itself. And then you get in the airplane and you realize, no, no, the flying is yeah. still way better. Uh-huh. Sure. This yeah. is interesting. I'd pay 50 bucks to see that movie in the theater again to be able to experience just that opening scene on the big screen. Oh, yeah. Um, uh. n- now, knowing that I want to pay every second of attention to it, whereas when I first saw it, you know, it was, you know, I was enjoying it, but I didn't know that, that I was going to enjoy it so right. much, you know. And uh, so I wonder, uh, I don't know how hard it is for, uh, I guess a theater actually can uh, rerun an old movie. So, yeah, we have, uh, you know, we've got a theater in our museum, uh, you know, here in, in Oshkosh, uh-huh. and we do a monthly movie night. In fact, just earlier, or just last week, we, I introduce those every every month. And we just work with a, with a company that licenses them to us. We pay a very, very small fee. And we've shown the uh-huh. Rocketeer there once that I've introduced. And then, of course, during the big event, we have our fly-in theater, we call it. And it's an 80-foot out uh, inflatable screen with outdoor seating. And we've had as many as 15,000 people in there. And we showed the Rocketeer there in probably 2010 or so. And uh, Oh, well, you're overdue then. I was going to say, we're definitely <laughs> overdue. I'm definitely going to start campaigning to bring it back. Next, yeah. next time there's an anniversary. And then just you know do everything we can to see if Billy will come out and, and uh, join me to introduce it there. Oh, my How goodness. Much fun that would be. be amazing. I think yeah. people would go. I think, I think he would be wonderfully surprised at the warm reception he'd get at Oshkosh. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, I, you know, and there's so many, I mean, with – with commercial uh, commercial streaming services like Fathom, Fathom Events, and things like that, I could see this playing in a bunch of theaters. If, oh, sure. Uh, if it had enough of a buildup, though, and I think you'd need, and like you said, it would need an anniversary, like maybe in uh, yeah. 2021 or something. Uh, we know, based on the the uh, Blu-ray release, that the latest uh, reincarnation of this is a 4K. Uh, they, they've digitized it in 4K, so it, it can hmm. be shown on a, on a large screen. I see. Yeah. But yeah, just being able to see that up a sixty foot wide uh, GB would be fantastic. Uh, that'd be something. And somehow we've got to lobby for a commentary, um, you know, to be put together from uh, Joe Johnston, which I don't know I, if you know. I, it'd be interesting to know how he feels about the movie, since I, I guess you guys haven't been able to have any uh, contact or right. yeah, well, we, well no we, we know how he feels about talking <laughs> <Yes. laughs> we uh his his final email to us was uh as always the answer is no nothing uh, personal joe i see so, so yeah so, yeah he's yeah, yeah i think i think for the right price he'd, he'd do something with it um but i i get the from i get the strong feeling he has no great love for uh, the disney uh yeah operation. although he yeah. does work for them he has yeah. done, right uh, the, the captain america stuff, i think but... I think if yeah. he if he's got the right property and things, right. Um, yeah. So I I do think that I think we'd have every reason to think that he does um, like the movie, the product that he put out. I think he's I think he's happy with that. But there's all these other issues that, right. that went with it, how it was yeah. handled and and the working conditions yeah, and everything sure. else. We certainly picked up yeah. a, a fair amount of that. You know, we pick up a bit of that from Billy. We picked up a lot of that from. Uh, Joe's ex-wife, Lisa Peterson, mm-hmm. who was a guest on a couple of episodes, right. and which, by the way, I've listened to every episode. I haven't missed any. Are you serious? So I just, that's amazing. I'm totally serious. You sir, well, let's, get out, let's and, get out the quiz. Yes, in, exactly. In episode, <laughs> in episode no, seventeen, yeah. <laughs> six minutes in, how breathed funny? Can you imitate that for us right now, please? <sighs> yeah, uh, there it was. Well done. <laughs> Um, huh. But no, it, I was going to say too that actually the this podcast was was great for me while I was working on the airplane, which I'm still working on the airplane. In <laughs> fact, yesterday I was listening to this podcast while working on the airplane. Oh, that's great. But I I did way back. In fact, I I was really confused because I think I had seen what Hal had posted on Facebook about the Rocketeer Minute, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm completely confused. <laughs> but I heard the word Rocketeer, so I'm <laughs> curious. What are we talking about here? And then I hear. Okay, Rocketeer Minute podcast. So I'm thinking, well, so is this like a minute long podcast <laughs> every day? About that so, doesn't make any sense. Jim, if okay. we had a nickel every time, 
every time somebody. Although you know, I can imagine if I only had to edit edit one yes. minute for I, oh, gosh, we could have done this ten times. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a lot Your life easier. Life would be right? so yeah. easy. So. Well, we just we just segue in and out of the opening yeah, exactly. and intro and outro yes. music, and it'll be perfect. Yeah. So. And I'm Hal but Bryan, like and that's people, our show. <laughs> yeah. But like most uh, people, I was totally out of the loop on this whole you know movie minute thing, which now I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, although I've tried to listen to a few of the others, and I'll have to say that partly because of the content of the Rocketeer, it's the only one that I've actually latched onto. So um, good job, you guys. But um, but it's a fascinating concept. I really, I really do like uh, the whole idea of the the movie minute thing. And uh, there was a point here somewhere. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but when I, I just didn't know what it was about. And oh, so then I figured it out. And I found it was great for me. I'd let them go about, let you guys get about a week ahead, and then so I could listen back to back to back to back <laughs> because I, I would be frustrated. What 23 minutes? No, 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 no. I want the 45 minute ones. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, oh, that's so, so if cool. I listened to multiples, it was great because it's just so relaxing, entertaining, and, and joyful for me. Here I am touching airplanes, and I'm hearing you guys talk about, you know, uh, airplanes. Like I can remember very clearly, I was working on fabric um, when you did the uh, uh, Craig Hoskins interviews, um, you know, on the whole aerial coordination stuff. And it's just like, oh my goodness, I'm touching an airplane and I'm listening to all this talk. It was absolutely fantastic. Oh, that's really good news. I had, a, I had a, I had a friend write me that uh, he had not listened for a while, and then he had listened to eight hours of our podcast <laughs> on a cross country trip. And I think, how can you sit through eight hours of us chatting and yapping about this? But it, if it passes the time, right. I can't even stand myself for eight hours. <laughs> so. uh, well, you can you can enjoy it in whatever whatever format you can digest yes. it, and we're very very happy to have had had people. And, and yeah. really, thanks so much for uh, for listening. Well, I'm and, thrilled and, that you guys are going to be doing the the Rocketeer 30 second thing. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think Hal's going to try that as a solo project. I'll listen in. Yeah. I'll tune in. Oh, jeez, it goes oh, second by second by second. Yeah, <laughs> and in this frame, <laughs> it's a pure yeah. quality. Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, we will. Well, you know, we will probably be back whenever the uh, the eventual sequel, if that ever occurs. Right. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, we'll be back to chat about. So, that. So, assuming and, it happens, and assuming we we love it. Because I I don't know if I could if I could do yeah. this and and pan a movie, I you know I, I I've know. loved this I, movie I've, for a quarter uh, century and and we we've, we've we've done now this is minute one hundred and three we've done one hundred and three episodes of talking about it minute by minute and I love it ten times as much as I did when we started and I didn't think that was mm. possible so it would yeah, be tough it, it, to go in and do a, a movie you disliked Pete the retailer and comic book Alex do the uh, the Star Wars minute they handled Attack of the Clones and managed to make it through that uh, after doing. Four mm. previous movies. So if anybody can handle something like that, I guess we could we could slog through and tell them what they did wrong. That's true. So. Yes. It, it it is interesting though when I think about it that I I almost hope they don't, which they probably won't ever make a follow up movie. But I almost hope they don't because they're almost sure to mess it up. Um, the odds are very good. Because, yeah. Just because of the the cultural difference that it is today than it was back then, so they're going to try to feel culturally relevant to today, which is going to ruin everything. Um, because because the film ultimately, I think, is culturally relevant to its own time period, and that's what made it so good. You know that it wasn't made for us in the '90s; it was a slice of the '30s for us to experience. Right. Yeah, I, uh, my my only uh, the the saddest part of this for me is that it's not going. They're not going to have a World War II Rocketeer movie. I would. Th I mean, yeah. I guess we did have that, and it was called Captain America. Yeah. But uh, I would have loved to have seen uh, Cliff Secord versus uh, you know, versus the Nazis overseas, and he's you know part of a a flying squad, and uh, he you know he he goes ahead of the bombers while he's flying around with a rocket pack, and you know landing landing on Stukas and punching the pilot <laughs> or something like that. But that's not that's not going to happen. It'll be uh, hopefully they'll have a writer that's capable of understanding Dave Stevens' original vision for uh, for the Rocketeer character and and build from that. Right. So we just got to keep our fingers crossed and uh, please don't mess please don't mess up yeah. this property. Yeah, really. So sure. wow. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Martin, th thanks so much for uh, uh, for being a part of the show. Uh, oh well, thank you. Getting winding down to the last few minutes here, uh, but it, it's great having you on, and it's nice knowing that uh, that people actively involved in the aviation um, world. I, I don't know what you can call the you know the, the whole universe of aviation from all different parts. Mm. Uh, it, it's nice to know that 
that so many people find find a common ground in the Rocketeer. Absolutely. And, uh, and thanks yep. for sharing it with us. You guys have done uh, for, a great job. I'm I'm glad you made it all the way through because or you know, you're almost there. Anyway. Not there yet. Stretch. <laughs> and but yes. it, it's a, a very daunting task, and and you've done a great job. So congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Yep. Yeah, it, it much appreciated. And hopefully, uh, hopefully there won't be another car on the runway while we're coming in for landing. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how that all turns out. Uh, but for for those of you who'd like to uh, join us on the conversation, we're always available on the social medias. We're out there on the Twitter, you know, on uh, Rocketeer Minute. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Rocketeer Minute, the great big website, rocketeerminute.com. Catch up on previous episodes and uh, the final remaining future episodes that are coming up. Uh, join us on uh, iTunes or Google Play. You can subscribe by just typing in Rocketeer Minute on either of those uh, platforms and uh, clicking subscribe and get the last uh, couple of episodes while we're still on the air. Uh, it, also, if you'd like to check out uh, Mark's site, uh, Airpigs with a Z dot com is still out there and uh lots of lots of material to to wade through i i i'm just looking at it myself I'm like you know i gotta i gotta really get into this now <laughs> so, um but uh, please check that out uh we will return tomorrow as we uh see uh poor gobsmacked cliff try to deal with the fact that he now owns a gb that he hasn't wrecked uh but uh, join us here tomorrow uh as we finish up get closer and closer to finishing up here on the rocketeer minute so we'll see you tomorrow until next time over and out go get him kid